Well, we're about to start on uh, duration and convexity, which will round out our, our chapter on interest rates. And uh, a word of, uh, well, not a word, a note here. Uh, typically, in a fixed income course, we would take somewhere between two to three weeks to cover the topic of duration and convexity because it is detailed, it can be intimidating, it can be difficult for the first time uh, uh, for the student first, uh, to first seeing this to get it in their head exactly what we're doing here. So this book uh, gives it five to six pages. Um, that's not a fair uh, introduction to duration, that is a review of duration and convexity. So if this is the first time you're seeing duration and convexity, uh, yeah, you're probably reading this going, I don't understand what this is saying at all. And the, uh, the exposition in the textbook is not meant to be explanatory, it's meant to be more of a review. If you're trying to learn it from those six pages, you're fighting your way through it. So I'm going to give you some links uh, uh, to duration and convexity that uh, uh, some videos are done for the CFA level uh, course because you have to know that at the CFA level. Uh, that explain it really nice. If you want to take a half hour out of your life to, uh, to be introduced to duration and convexity, it'll give you a much better understanding of what it means. If you already get duration and convexity, you can move on or treat the next half hour as, uh, as a nice review. So let's get to it. We know that the price and the yield to the maturity of a bond have an inverse relationship. As the yield to maturity increases, the price of a bond decreases. As the yield decreases, the price of a bond increases, but it's not a straight line. It is a convex relationship between the two that look like this. So let's be clear. First of all, we have a convex relationship. So I think you can already start to see uh, where we get the term convexity from. Duration and convexity, well, we have a convex relationship. So we must have some, some type of convexity measure, right? Well, we will. Let's take a point on the, the curve at random, um, just for exposition purposes. And that has got a yield of y, and it'll have a present value of pv0. There we go. So if we want to know what happens when y changes, so for a change in y, what happens to the present value? So if we increase y by a certain percentage, uh, let's say uh, 20 basis points or 10 basis points, or decrease y by 10 basis points, what percentage change could we expect in the price? That's what duration measures. Duration gives us some type, a, a, a sensitivity of the percentage change in the bond for a given change in yield. So for some change in yield, we want to know the change in the present value of the bond. Well, that is approximately, being that we have a convex relationship, we don't have a constant curve. If it was a straight line relationship, we'd have a constant slope. We can figure out the, price, the percentage change of the price of the bond easily at any point for y. It would be the same amount throughout the entire uh, uh, yield curve. But it's convex. So what we can do in this, in this situation is we can find the slope of the tangent to that point. And by finding the slope to the tangent, we know that we are taking a derivative, right? The derivative of the uh, of present value with respect to y. So the rate of change in the present value with respect to a change in y. That's what that is saying times the change in y that we're trying to measure. That's all that is, times the uh, uh, rate of change that we're trying to measure. Well, the first term I've given you is uh, a multiplication term, which is the bond price, uh, the a negative relationship between the present value of the bond and something called duration, a measure d. And duration, which you will see as soon as I finish this part, duration really is a break-even point. It's sort of a break-even point on a coupon-paying bond. On a zero-coupon bond, duration is the term of the bond. But on a coupon-paying bond, break e it's the break-even point of the bond that balances 
because we have two uh, two forms of uh, of uh, cash flow off a coupon paying bond, right? We have the reinvestment of the coupon. So it balances reinvestment and present value. Let's think about that for a minute. If the yield to maturity on a bond increases, the price will decrease. But since the yield to maturity has increased, since interest rates have increased, every time we get a coupon payment, we can now reinvest that coupon payment at higher and higher rates. So we're getting a higher reinvestment return, but we have a lower price. D, duration, is the break-even point that balances the increase in the reinvestment return with the drop in price and tells us how long in years we must hold that bond to hit break even. So on a 10 year bond, we might have a duration of 7.25. That tells us that for a given change in, the, in yield, a given change in the bond's own yield to maturity, we might have to hold a bond 7.25 years to realize a balance between the change in the price and the change in the reinvestment return. So we can think of it as a break-even point. Uh, so let's, uh, let's figure out, first of all, how do we calculate this thing called duration? So let's watch this. And keep in mind that what you're watching is not using e to the rt. We're not, uh, when, when, when we start discounting the cash flows, we're discounting them at uh, an annual or a semi-annual, a quarterly rate. Typically, we would, we would discount continuously, e, sorry, e to the negative rt. Uh, so watch this and just uh, remember that uh, for the discounting, you would just use a, a continuous uh, compounding, uh, or, sorry, a continuous discounting uh, with this. And then we'll come back to, uh, to what we're doing here. So I think it would be helpful before we dive right in to all the duration statistics we'll be calculating to first look at some of the calculations that go into uh, Macaulay duration because everything starts with Macaulay duration. All the other durations are sort of a modification of that. So let's just have a look at, at what we're going to do to set it up first so that we have an intuitive understanding when we look at that really imposing and impending formula that's not only one line long in the book, but folds over into the next line, and then there's a long list of variable names after it. Let's just break it down. So this is our 10-year our, uh, our bond. As you could see, there are 10 years. It's an annual bond, 8% coupon. You could see each payment here, the cash flow is 8. In the final year, we get the future value and the present value, uh, sorry, the face value and the coupon, 100 plus 8. Our discount rate, is 10.4%, so our R plus 1, or 1 plus R is 1.104. So what we want to do is take each cash flow and find its present value. So this 7.246, the calculation in this cell, is really just 8 discounted back for one period at 10.4%. The next cell is 8 discounted back at 10.4%, for two periods. So each payment is discounted backwards. You can see the final payment here is the future value plus the coupon payment discounted back for 10 periods. It totals 85.503075 if we round it off. And you'll know that, notice that as the example we've used in the textbook, that's been the price of this 10 year 8% annual coupon bond when the market rate is 10.4%, it's being 85.5. Nothing new here. So all we've done is calculate the present value of this bond, but we've broken it down into the sum of the present value of all the individual cash flows. That's all we've done. Well, let's put this in common form. And if you've done any accounting before, you understand that common form means that you put one number as 100% and everything is listed as a percentage of that 100%. So we will call the present value, the full price of the bond, the 85.5030 here, we will call that 100%. And we will express each of these components as a percentage of the total. So the first payment of $7, the present value of $7.24.63 represents 8.47% of the total price of the bond. The next one represents 7.68%, then 6.95, etc., etc. So if we add up all the weights, they should add up to 100%. 
So all we've done, again, is expressed each of the individual present values as a percentage of its total. And since each is expressed as a percentage of its total and the total is 100, it should add up to 100. That's easy enough. Beautiful. Now what we've done is we found our weights. We need a weight. How do we get the weight? We multiply the percentage by the time period because we're weighting these cash flows by time period. So 1 times 8.47% is 8.47. 2, because it's 2 years now, it's 2 years multiplied by the weight, the present value weight of the total, gets us to 0.15. Now these are not percentages. These are weights. When we add up all the weights, we get to this number down here, 7.0029. That is the duration statistic. So how do we read that? Well, typically we read it in years, but what it really is is periods. So in other words, this is 7.0029 periods. It just so happens that our periodicity here is annual, so now it already is in years. But if this were semi-annual, if this were a five-year bond instead of a 10-year bond, and these were semi-annual payments, this would be 7.0029 periods. So to get it in years, we would have to divide it by two, 3.5 years of a five-year bond. So be very careful with that duration statistic. Just because it, you get a, a statistic doesn't mean it's, it's in years. The statistic itself is in periods. You have to annualize it by turning it in years. It's only stated in years if the bond itself has an annual coupon. So I'm going to stop right there on this one. I've got more down here. We'll come back to this spreadsheet to figure out what all of these other numbers mean. But for now, I just want you to understand that so that when we get to that really imposing formula, I'm going to draw three little circles around the, around the, uh, the formula to show you that it's really, really simple. Each of those circles corresponds to one of these columns. So, hopefully now you understand how duration is calculated. We've seen how that's done. And let's finish up with what we were doing here. So, here is our tangent line to the curve. So, look what's going on here. If we have very small changes, look at these little changes I'm doing in the yield. If we have very small changes in Y, duration is a very good approximation to what would actually happen because remember we have a convex curve, right? But for very small changes, we'll be very close. So that simplifying this, now that we know how to calculate D, we can simplify the rate of change in here. We're looking for the percentage change in the price, which is just the change in the present value for a change in Y divided by PV naught. That will give us a percentage change, right? Let's make sure we say that that's the percentage change in price will equal negative d times the change in y. Negative d times the change in y. So that will give us a measure, a very close approximation of the change in the bond price for a small change in the yield. But what happens if we have a much larger change in the yield? Notice that if we have a change over here and an equal change uh, to the negative side, we're not getting a very good approximation. So duration will only get us so far. We're missing this gap in between here. And we're missing this over here. So one is going to undervalue, one is going to overvalue because we're off the curve. The curve itself is a measure of duration, or sorry, the tangent is a measure of duration. To that, we would add this section, which is called a convexity adjustment. Convexity adjustment. And for convexity adjustment, uh, on the, uh, in the next video, next video, I will explain both duration, uh, sorry, modified duration is next, modified duration followed by convexity. 
So that's in the next video. If you get modified duration and convexity, you don't have to watch it. But if you want a nice review of exactly how we calculate these, uh, go ahead and watch. Keeping in mind, of course, that in this book we're concerned with continuous compounding. At the CFA level, we don't really talk about it too much. It's more uh, periodic compounding, which means we're interested in the M.